All right, good evening to everybody. We are continuing now with um, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 4. We have looked at how Samuel, um, how Samuel being, um, or how Samuel was born, his background, and how Hannah, his mother, gave him over to the temple under Eli, and Eli's two sons, Ophni and Phinehas were wicked priests in God's eyes and God sent a prophet to tell Eli that he was going to judge uh, Eli's house as well as uh, also punish Ophni and Phinehas with their death. And then God confirmed this prophecy through little Samuel. Okay, so God has actually twice given the information that uh, he would deal with Eli's um, family line as the priests that were ungodly in God's eyes. So we look at now the, um, the materializing of that punishment or the materializing of the prophecy of God concerning the uh, dealing with Eli's family line. Huh? So we're going to read from 1 Samuel chapter 4. Can somebody read for us chapter 4, 1 to 11? Can you turn your Bible with me to 1 Samuel chapter 4? Somebody read for us up to verse 11. At that time, Israel was at war with the Philistines. The Israelite army was camped near Ebenezer, and the Philistines were at Ephah. The Philistines attacked and defeated the army of Israel, killing 4,000 men. After the battle was over, the troops retreated to their camp, and the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord allow us to be defeated by the Philistines? Then they say, Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. If we carry it into battle with us, it will save us from our enemies. So they sent men to Shiloh to bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Heaven's armies, who is enthroned between the cher cherubim. Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli were also there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. Verse 5. When all the Israelites saw the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord into the camp, their shout of joy was so loud, it made the ground shake. What's going on? The Philistine asked. What's all the shouting about in the Hebrew camp? When they were told it was because the Ark of the Lord had arrived, they panicked. The gods have come into their camp, they cried. This is a disaster. We have never had to face anything like this before. Help! Who can save us from these mighty gods of Israel? They are the same gods who destroyed the Egyptians with plagues when Israel was in the wilderness. Fight as never before, the Philistines. If you don't, we will become the Hebrew slave, just as they have been ours. Stand up like men and fight. So the Philistines fought desperately, and Israel was defeated again. The slaughter was great. 30,000 Israelite soldiers died that day. The survivors turned and fled to, into their tents. Verse 11, the Ark of God was captured, and Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were killed. Okay, thank you. All right, so we see that the Philistines actually came to war with the Israelites. So the Israelites, they camped at Ebenezer. Ebenezer means stone of help. Uh, we find it mentioned here, and we will find it mentioned again in chapter 7. Okay, so we will have to see chapter 4 all the way to chapter 7 for a complete story. Now, in chapter 4, we have the Israelites camping at Ebenezer and the Philistines at Afek. And so they are at war. 
right? And we see that the Philistines defeated Israel and killed about 4,000 Israelites. And so when the leaders of Israel retreated back to camp, they were saying, why did God bring defeat on us today before the Philistines? And they wanted to bring the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with them and save them from the hand of their enemies. So we see that the Israelites' leaders, they were shocked that they lost the battle. They evidently expected God to give Israel the victory because they were wondering, why did the Lord bring defeat? And then they wanted to bring the ark. And notice it says, may go with us and save us. So they expect, they expect the ark to save them. There's something wrong here. They are thinking about the ark, their understanding. Okay, but first of all, let's see. The significance and the lesson we can learn is they are now suffering the consequences of abandoning God. Just like in the book of Judges, because remember, this period is also the period of the Judges. Okay, this is also the period of the Judges. And because they abandoned God, God allowed their enemies to attack and oppress them. In the same way, we see that Christians and also leaders expect God to bless, protect, and give victory. They just didn't understand why they were defeated. But this defeat shows that it's not always the case that God blesses, protects, and gives victory. One of the reasons God allows his people to experience defeat and problems is to draw their attention to realize their sin and failures. Very often in the Bible, that's the case. However, the people can be too wayward to think of checking and identifying their fault and sin. You see, after they say, why did God bring defeat? The next thing is they say, let's bring the ark to fight and let it save us. So they don't even identify their sin or their fault or their problem. Because you see people, to think of what went wrong is negative thinking. You know? And to, to them, God is not like that. God is not about negative thinking. Many people like to make God all about the power of positive thinking, right? This is not humanistic, Christ uh, sorry, this is humanistic Christianity. It's not biblical Christianity. What do I mean by uh, uh, humanistic Christianity? It's Christianity that humans make up you know, in our own image. We want to make up our religion in the way that we are as human beings. So we human beings like to see things with positive thinking, as we think of power of positive thinking. And also they try to make it like God will surely bring us victory. And since, oh, since we didn't have victory, maybe the power of positive thinking should be, we should bring the up of God's covenant that will save us. But that is really molding God into human image, not trying to imitate God and be molded by Him. And you see that they want the ark to save them. Is it the ark that saves people? It definitely is not because we will see what happens when they brought the ark to war. So verse 4, we have the people bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty and and to it enthroned between the cherubim from Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, they went along with the Ark of the Covenant. They had been dishonoring God so long, it did not strike them that God was not going to help them in this battle. You see how religious people can be, right? They dishonor so God and God so long, rather. And they don't even think that God is doing anything against them. They don't even think that God disapproves of them. Even though there was a prophet that came along and told their father Eli, their father Eli had been rebuking. They didn't think that it was that bad because, hey, God didn't strike me down. I'm still okay. 
And you know, it was probably years. It was probably years since that prophecy. And during these years, uh, Samuel would be growing up. Okay? So these two sons of Eli who were priests, they thought they could dishonor God in the past and now they bring the ark. It's a protection and God will save them. God will help them to win the battle. Obviously, they think that way. Otherwise, why would they want to go? Correct? They would go because they think that they can, their presence with the ark will enhance perhaps their prestige when they come back victorious. Otherwise, if they think they're going to die, they wouldn't go. Okay, so we see that instead of self-reflecting and seeking the Lord, the Israelites tried to use the ark, which is actually a symbol, okay? It's actually a symbol of God's presence. But they use it as a talisman to bring them victory. It had become an idol to protect them. Because it had become an idol, they said, uh, so that it may go with us and save us. So they are expecting this to become an idol now. You know, and Christians can think likewise that an point action will ensure God's blessing or protection, like wearing a cross. If somebody says, I wear a cross because I'm a Christian, it protects me, then that is totally the same behavior and thinking people here, thinking that the up will save them. So some people wearing the cross think the cross will save them, protect them. Yeah? Or some people think they go to church regularly, they give their offering, they give their tithing or whatever, and sure they will be protected. It's looking at the actions, it's looking at the symbols as protecting them rather than God himself rather than their relationship with God. You see how it can be a very fine line? Because it's invisible. You see, it's an invisible belief system that we can just easily embrace this kind of thinking that I go to church, I give, and I will be saved. I will be protected. Not thinking that it's about the relationship with God that's the important thing. So what the people did not realize was that this was the occasion when God's prophecy against the house of Eli would come true, starting with the deaths of his two sons. That was the prophecy. The sign that his two sons would die would be the fulfillment of the prophecy happening. And so we learn God's judgment may be slow in human eyes, but it is Okay? Uh, because you see, it took years. And so in those years, people would think, ah, nothing happened to me. I'm still fine. You know? So uh, it cannot be that bad. God cannot take it so seriously. But judgment comes surely, no matter how long it takes. So these priests show people can exploit religion for what is wrong in God's eyes. And they still think God will help or protect them, right? And it's in that sense, we are thinking, manipulate God. Is it possible that we mix what should be done in right worship with the wrong that we want to do or want to get out of worship like these two priests? You see, so we mix what should be done with the wrong that we want. And we together and we think this is acceptable but this will make a big difference on the impact on others and in right worship okay because the other people will pick up the wrong teaching and the wrong understanding and we in danger of that happening when we do wrong things or older christians do wrong things nothing seems to happen to them so other newer Christians copy the wrong things that they do. So when we find in verse 5 to 9, all Israel, they saw the ark of God coming into the camp. They all, hooray, they all shouted. And that shook the ground. Okay? So for the Israelites, they believed in a false hope. 
This is a false hope, thinking that the ark is going to save them. The ark was actually just a symbol. So they are having false hope in a symbol of God's presence, not God himself. Okay, so you see how it is believing, not in God himself, but believing in a false hope, something connected to God. Such a fine line. Such a fine line. But we can easily be deceived, thinking the wrong thing. Our hope must be based on the truth that's God's word and the person of God himself. Okay? So hope must be based on truth and God himself. Not things about God or things from God. Is there any chance that we confuse the things of God with God himself? Well, that was the Israelites. Now let's look at the Philistines' response to the ark coming into the Israelite camp. When the Philistines learned that the ark of God had come into the camp, they were afraid. And they said, a God has come into the camp. We are in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? They are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues. So now the, for the Philistines, they look at this as gods. You know, the god Adonai became gods to them. And so it's like the gods of Israel that fought against the gods of the Egyptians and they struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. So they have positive thinking. There you go. They have positive thinking. Be strong, Philistines. Just like the Israelites, they had positive thinking. Yeah? Be men. You know, we must be macho. Or you will be subject to the Hebrews or they will make you slaves. So you must have positive thinking. Believe in positive thinking, the power. Uh, and then you be men and you fight. So this is all, you see, the Israelites and the Philistines are the same. Power of positive thinking. But God is not about power of positive thinking. So let's look a little bit more about the Philistines. They were frightened. Just now, Magdalene's version said they panicked. They were frightened by the stories of how God intervened for Israel when the Israelites left Egypt. Now, behind this statement, it shows that the truth of God's work had been retained and told to other people. You see, this is a few generations after Moses already. Yeah? And still the Philistines do know the stories about God saving Israel from Egypt. Just like, you know, for us non-Christians, Jesus Christ saving us Christians. So God's work and word has been taught and retained. So we must keep alive the word of God so that the world of non-Christians know and can receive God's truth. But, here's a very important but, we must ensure that we do not share distorted truth about God. It can have the truth that is correct, but we can also jumpo jumpo with distorted truth. The, for the Philistines here, they thought there were gods that saved Israel. So to them, it was gods of Egypt versus gods of Israel. Two sets of gods fighting. Okay? So you see, while they have certain truth correct, they also have certain truth incorrect. Understanding truth now distorts the, the real truth about God. Okay? That's one part. Now, but Israel themselves had turned away from God and now clung only to a form of godliness. So the God that fought for them in Egypt, for now they turned from, uh, as of now they have turned away from God and they were cling on to a form of godliness. And their form of godliness, 
they believe in the up saving them, not about God. So people, churches and organisations often try to live on these memories of God's past blessings. Right? And Israel assumed wrongly that just because God gave them victory in the past, he would do it again, even though they strayed far from him. So that's Israel and the sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. The truth is spiritual victories come by continually renewing our relationship with God. Okay? It is God that saves us. It is not his ark. It is not his cross. Cross doesn't save us. It doesn't have a power. It's just an object. Okay? We cannot live off the past. The past is important to remind us that God can give us the victory because of his love, his plan, and our obedience. It gives us hope for the future. You see, the past, why we study past, one of the reasons for the Israelites is about hope for the future. And it is not a guarantee of present deliverance especially if we have not been careful to stay in, on track with Christian living and obedience. That means in our relationship with God. Okay, so past is good because it speaks of the future and it speaks of the fact that God is for us, but we must keep in relationship with God. So verse 10 and 11 we find the Israelites, uh, sorry, the Philistines fought and they defeated the Israelites. Every Israelite fled from his tent and the Israelites actually lost 30,000 soldiers this time. So they lost a total of 34,000 soldiers in these two wars or these two battles. So that's the first thing. They lost 30 soldiers this second round. They lost the art of God and they, and they also uh, lost the two sons of Hof, uh, Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, who died. So three things happened. The art of God was taken away. 30,000 soldiers died and the two priests, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Three important things. So we see in this battle between the Philistines and the Israelites, the Philistines don't have God. But Israel also didn't have God's protection. So in a kind of situation like this, what happens? You know, God's people don't have his protection. The enemies don't have God. So in a battle between two human forces, like this case, okay, God allowed the enemy to be the instrument to execute his judgment on the priests. So that's the first thing. The enemy was the instrument to execute the prophecy of God that the two priests would die. Okay, that's one. Also, the Israelites. But looking at the two priests, we see that God uses both the good and the bad to carry out his will to accomplish his purposes. The Philistines are the enemies of God's people, so-called the bad, right? God also uses the bad people to, in this case, punish his wayward people. And later on, God will do the same thing uh, with the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire. They would be used to punish God's people also. Okay? And they were very... Uh, they were very aggressive enemies, very aggressive warriors. But he will also deal with the wicked for the excesses. That means even though God used these wicked people to punish his own people, if the wicked people go overboard in their behavior, God will deal with them. Okay? So God is fair in that sense to judge all people for their wickedness. If including his own people. All right? God's own people will also be uh, dealt with by God. 
On the other hand, it is important for people who can see the wrong of spiritual leaders, uh, for example, Hophni and Phinehas, to pray about the situation if, if these people are not in a position to talk to them about it. And obviously, you would need a lot of patience to pray about it because Hophni and Phinehas, since their prophecy that they would die until now, the real happening, it took years. It took years. So for us to pray sometimes for spiritual leaders when we see wrong things, we may have to be patient to persevere. Okay, so as a little sidetrack, I just talked a little bit about prayer. One of the greatest dynamics of prayer is that it sends God's potential power to effect a change or a transformation in places, in people, in perspectives, in situations that we cannot reach. There are some places we can't go physically. Prayer is a dynamic that sends God's potential power there to those places to change things. That's why we pray for America, we pray for Hong Kong, we pray for China, and we pray for all those different people in different places. Prayer is that very great dynamic of God's potential power sent there. Right? And also to people. Sometimes it's people close to us or people far away or people that we're struggling with. All right? Prayer sends God's potential power to change. Okay, it's not a talisman or it's not a kind of like a, a, a magical power. Huh? Okay, we cannot expect God to change people to fit us. We pray for God, uh, we pray to God for people so that people can appreciate and understand the correct perspective of God. So we also pray that God can change perspectives that of people, even ourselves, that cannot that we can't deal with, or even situations that we can't reach. So prayer is a very special, can I say, weapon God gives us, right, which we must learn to use properly. Yeah, I cannot use prayer anyhow, or that, otherwise it will be very harmful. Just like, you know, a, a, a knife in a young child's hand could end up hurting the child or hurting other people. Okay? So it's the good thing about prayer is it's free. You can pray anywhere. You can pray anytime. You can pray with or without people. Just pray by yourself also can. You just need to make time and have the heart for it. So you see, prayer is that amazing and it shows how great God is. So we can pray for spiritual leaders if we see things that are wrong. Just be prepared. Sometimes God answers prayer very fast. Sometimes it takes time, it takes years. But importantly, it's our response. Okay, I repeat. What's important is our response. So let's continue the story from chapter 4, verse 12 to the, the chapter. Can somebody turn and read for us now? 1 Samuel chapter 4. Reading from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. Verse 12, death of Eli. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road, watching because his heart feared for the ark of God. When the men entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Verse 14. Eli heard the outcry and asked, What is the meaning of this uproar? The men hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old and whose eyes were set so that he could not see. He told Eli, I just came from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, what happened, my son? The man who fought the news, who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistine and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and the art of God has been captured. Verse 18. 
When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken and he died. For he was an old man and heavy. He had led Israel 40 years. Verse 19. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phinehas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God has been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pain. As she was dying, the woman attending her said, Don't despair. You have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay any attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying that the glory has departed from Israel. Because of the capture of the ark of God, the death of her father-in-law and her husband, she said the glory has departed from Israel, but the ark of God has been captured. Thank you, Robert. All right, so the story continues. Now this time, we are back to Shiloh or Shiloh. Okay, and so somebody from the Benjamite tribe went back, ran. So they are war runners, people who run to break the news. And Eli was actually waiting, sitting on his chair, watching, because a heart feared for the safety of the ark of God. You see, whatever his failure, Eli still focused on the ark, still focused on God, okay? And the whole town sent up a cry when the men told what had happened. So for Eli, who was blind, he couldn't see, right? He was blind, he couldn't see, and he was already 98 years old. He could hear. So he was curious, Okay, and then he asked the young man what happened and the man told him about Israel's defeat by the Philistines. That's the first significant thing, the defeat. Second thing, the death of his two sons. And third thing, the Ark of God had been captured. When he heard that news, the Ark of God had been captured, he fell backwards off his chair, right? And then he broke his neck and died for he was very old man and heavy. He had led Israel for 40 years. Okay, so you see that uh, Eli was very heavy because actually another Bible translation says he was fat. And you know why he was fat, right? God rebuked him in chapter 2 verse 29 that he and his sons have been fattening themselves on God's offerings. So even though Eli scolded his sons, he was still eating the things that the sons did that was wrong, right? So in a way, like I said, while he's scolding, his buck is worse than his bite, right? His scolding has no value because uh, no punishment plus he, he ate it anyway, you know? They did the wrong thing, but he's, he just didn't abstain and he ate it himself. So he's very fat and he died because he was old and fat, he broke his neck when he fell. But, you know, very interesting thing, the Bible ends with this statement, he had led Israel for 40 years. Okay, so what lessons can we learn? He was fearful or concerned about the ark. But here's one thing that struck me when I read. Eli, we, he, he knew it was wrong, he heard God's judgment, but he never repented. That, that's a sad thing about somebody like that. And another person that falls into this category would be Judas. Judas knew he betrayed Jesus. He brought the money back and he threw it. He threw the money back. But he, even though he was filled with remorse, we never read that he repented. He just went to commit suicide. Here, same for Eli, he knew his big mistake, but we never read about his repentance. So you, you can see how in us as Christians and even sometimes as leaders in some way, right? we know something we have done wrong, but we don't repent. Sometimes we just accept it or we, we just carry on or we feel helpless. 
and we don't end up repenting. So Eli seems to be one of those cases, sad cases, ended up not well because there was no repentance. There was no change of heart and behavior all right, in stopping his sons. So he died from the shock that the ark had been captured. He knew that his sons would die and this was the time that it happened. Okay, so he didn't die from old age, but he died from a fall. So God's prophecy that his family would lose their priestly leadership, but implied that the family line itself would continue to exist, was starting to be fulfilled. With the deaths of Eli and his sons, the only male member in his family line that we know, huh? there may be others, but we, we don't know. What we know is he had a baby grandson that his great-daughter-in-law gave birth to and named Ichabod. Glory. Okay, so let's come back to that statement I said, the interesting statement. He had led Israel for 40 years. At his death, you see that Bible provides an epitaph. You know, an epitaph is a very short carving on a tombstone. Right? At a tomb there, Somebody who has died, there's a stone. And normally they will, they will carve something very short and simple about the person's life. So the Bible gives this acknowledgement he had led Israel for 40 years. That's something interesting. Having read the book of Judges, we can see that he played an important role as a judge in his generation. To a certain extent, we see that he held the worship of the Israelites together. A lot of these Israelites were still coming to Shiloh to worship God. Okay? But the priestly ministry was in a bad state. That's the sad part. Okay? So while he held the people, remember Elkanah and Hannah, they came yearly to worship. Right? So Eli held the worship of the Israelites together, but the priestly system was all in a bad shape. Because his sons had been doing as they saw fit, like what we saw in the book of Judges. And here they used worship to benefit themselves. Just like the story of Micah in, or Micah in Judges 17, the young Levite also came to be his priest, personal priest. Okay? So they are using worship to benefit themselves. Eli had made a limited spiritual leadership impact on Israel. But the consequences of his death is that the Israelites now badly needed a new leader or judge to rescue them from foreign attack. Okay, so he is the latest judge that died up to now. And so Israel is now in need of a new judge to help them. So let's take a look at Eli's daughter-in-law. This was really a bad time to hear the news, right? She was near delivery and yet she had this bad news, three bad news, three pieces. The ark had been captured, father-in-law died, husband died. And so because of the stress of this kind of situation, she went into labor and gave birth to a boy that she named Ichabod and then she died because the glory had left Israel with the capture of God's ark. Okay, so we see that the family, there are people who suffer consequences of the sin in the family. Yeah, you have Eli's failure, you have the failure of the husband and the brother, all right? And so she also now experiences death for herself, okay? That there's no more glory because the glory has left with the ark. So we see that the spiritual impact of these people is very important. What kind of spiritual infect, impact do we make in our spiritual community? And like what God has been saying to Eli about himself and his sons, what will God say about what we have been doing or we have done? So we may not have a Bible chapter writing about ourselves,
But certain B, God has something to say about us. So it's good to learn from this story to take stock on ourselves because it says that God actually is aware of what is happening with us and is God pleased with us. So now we want to look at a question. Did Israel pay a very high price for the sins of two men, Hophni and Phinehas, who deserve to die? What about the thousands of Israelites who died on the battlefield? Remember how many, how many Israelites died? Over two battles? First, 3, how many? 3,400. No. 4,000 the first battle, 30,000 the second battle. Mm, 34,000. So total, 34,000. Wow, 34,000 people died. Is it because of the two men? That's a question that we may be wondering. Now, the book of Judges shows that Israel suffered many military defeats when she was unfaithful to God. Right? When we read the book of Judges, the enemies always came, defeated the Israelites and oppressed them until they suffered. First Samuel chapter 7, which we, we will study in due time, verses 3 to 4 gives an illuminating fact that Israel was still guilty of idolatry up to Samuel's time. Okay, you can read it for yourself. While they were receiving God's word from Samuel, that was chapter, chapter 4 verse 1 or some versions will be chapter uh, 3, the last verse. While they were receiving God's word from Samuel, they were still worshipping their foreign gods. So they married, God, married the gods together to worship. The more gods, the merrier because the more gods, then more blessing. That's the human, humanistic thinking. Yeah, some religions are like that. You give me more God's good, then more God's to bless me and protect me. So they seem to have this God and their bows and Ashtoreths all at their home that they worship. So it would appear that Israelites died on the battlefield as a result of the nation's unfaithfulness to God. It wasn't just these two men. All right? These two men died for their own sins, but a lot of Israelites died because of the nation's unfaithfulness to God. But these two men would cause the family line, consequences on their own family line. Okay, so you can see how uh, one person's sin can actually have impact on people around. Today, are we guilty of receiving God's word while worshipping Him with our modern vows and ashtoreths? And what could our versions of vows and ashtoreths be? You know, we have God, but we also have other, other priorities that are as good as idols that we need to be careful of. Okay, so let's look at chapter 5. Okay, let's look at chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a short chapter. So can somebody read chapter 5 for us? It's just 12 verses. Okay, I'll read chapter 5, First Samuel chapter 5. After the Philistines had captured the Ark of God, they took it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then they carried the Ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. When the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fall, fallen on his face on the ground before the Ark of the Lord. They took Dagon and put him back in his place. But the following morning when they rose, there was Dagon fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. His head and hands had been broken off and were lying on the threshold. Only his body remained. That is why to this day, neither the priests of Dagon nor any others who entered Dagon's temple at Ashdod stepped on the threshold. Verse 6. The Lord's hand was heavy on the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. He brought devastation on them and afflicted them with tumors. When the people of Ashdod saw what was happening, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy on us and on Dagon, our God. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and asked them, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, 
have the ark of the God of Israel moved to God. So they moved the ark of the God of Israel. Verse 9. But after they had moved it, the Lord's hand was against that city, throwing it into a great panic. He afflicted the people of the city, both young and old, with an outbreak of tumors. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. As the ark of God was entering Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought the ark of the God of Israel around to us to kill us and our people. Verse 11. So they called together all the rulers of the Philistines and said, Send the ark of the God of Israel away. Let it go back to its own place, or it will kill us and our people. For death has filled the city with panic. God's hand was very heavy on it. Verse 12. Those who did not die were afflicted with tumors, and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. Thank you. Okay. So here's a very, very interesting chapter, right? Because we really see some miracles happening. So in chapter 5, the first five verses, we see that the Philistines captured the ark and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. So Ashdod was the first Philistine city that the ark visited. Okay. Uh, they set it beside Dagon or Dagon in, in the temple. And then the next morning, they found that this Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So it's like, I worship you. One God worshipping the other God. So they put Dagon back in his place. But the next morning, the same thing happened. And this time, his head and hands were broken off and were lying on the threshold. So only his body remained. And then from then, the priests and the others did not step on the threshold when they entered Dagon's temple. So here we see two gods together. And Adonai, the God of Israel, showed his power over other gods. In this case, Dagon. Okay? He had already showed his power over Egyptian gods. Now he showed his power over Dagon, the Philistine god. Now, it, is, it was common practice in the ancient Near East when people conquered idols that they captured from some would put these in the temples of their own deities, believing that their god had defeated and captured the god of their enemies. Okay, can you see? So, the human beings are victors over the enemy. So, that means I capture you. That means my God, capture your God also. Okay? So that's how I win, because my God, capture your God. So the Philistines thought that Dagon had now defeated and captured Adonai. Okay? So they put Adonai as the captive God in their Dagon God's temple. But it became clear that Dagon was not even in control of his own statue, because he just collapsed two times, and it was broken even. Okay, and it led to a local superstition, one thing. But once again, we see that God showed he could fend for himself, even in enemy territory. Okay, the wisdom, that is the head, and the power, that's the hands of Dagon, was nothing to him. Okay, so God broke the head, God broke the hands, meaning your wisdom and your power is nothing to me. Yeah, so God, you see, God could fend for himself. Once again, I come to this topic. No matter how long it takes, God will fend for himself. Okay, even people may not know, uh, God will fend for himself. So in chapter 5, verses 6 to 12, we see that the Lord's hand was heavy upon the people of Ashdod and its vicinity. So even the surrounding was impacted, not just Ashdod itself, but the surrounding. Okay, so he brought devastation, so that's quite a lot of damage, and afflicted them with tumors. And it said, the ark of the God of Israel must not stay here with us, because his hand is heavy upon us, and upon Dagon, our God. So now, you see, they acknowledge that the God of Israel is more powerful than their Dagon God. And the thing is, they don't realize it, but this is just a symbol. The Ark 
Remember, we said the ark was a symbol. It's not even God himself. Can you imagine the symbol is there already? You, the pagan cannot stand. Okay, if God himself really came and did whatever he wanted, Dagon would be ashes. So they called their rulers and the Philistines, uh, of the Philistines, and they asked them, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And the ruler said, oh, move it to Geth. Okay, so first one was Ashdod, now to Geth. So they brought the ark there. But after they moved it, God's hand acted against that city also and threw it into a great panic. So he afflicted the people of the city, young and old. So no discrimination, uh, disease, right? With an outbreak of tumors, just like what we have, COVID-19, no discrimination, young and old, also kana. So they sent the Ark of God to Akron, the third Philistine state. And then as the Ark of God was entering, you see the people all crying out, oh, they brought the Ark to kill us and our people. So it has a reputation, okay? The reputation that this God of Israel kills us. So they called together the rulers and said, send the up of the God of Israel away. Go to its own place or it will kill us and our people. For death had filled the city with panic and God's hand was very heavy upon it. So the Bible makes it very clear it's not accident, it's not coincidence, it's God's hand on it. Okay? So, Let's see what we can learn, what lessons we can learn. Um, verse 6 makes it very clear. We, are not, we, are, we don't even need to guess. Verse 6, the Lord's hand was heavy upon the people. So it reveals that God himself was responsible for the events in Ashdod. And for the Philistines there, they had no revelation from God. He didn't tell them anything. But for us, reading the Bible, we know. They, the Philistines, have no knowledge, so they have to make their own deductions. Okay, scientific deductions if you want, logical deductions if you want, uh, superstitious deductions if you want, but they have to make their own conclusions. So they saw the collapse of their idol, they were puzzled. They were also puzzled by their own personal sufferings. Why? Why are we having this kind of diseases, tumors? Okay, now they had witnessed a great victory by Israel's God over their idol Dagon. You know, the, the Dagon got the head and the hands were broken. Yeah, so obviously this, this Israelite God is very powerful over the Dagon. But they didn't act on their insight until they were personally afflicted with tumors. They didn't say, wow, that God more powerful. My God is actually useless. I should be worshipping that, that more powerful, true God. The fact is, He is the true God. Similarly, people don't respond to biblical truth until they experience personal pain and suddenly feel they have no place left to turn. Isn't what that true of many people? They can hear stories about Jesus Christ. They can hear stories about God. But, ah, yeah, that is what you say. Okay? But when they experience personal pain and crisis and they have no place left to turn, that is when they start to ask questions and respond. So instead of fear of the Lord, which, is, which, which it is right to have, People wait until they are in fear of terror, two different kinds of fear, before they respond to God. You see, fear of the Lord, which is reverence and respect, the right thing to have, but we don't respond to God. Fear of terror, that one, when our emotions hit panic level, then we respond to God. So we are people, you see, who are very dependent on emotions to direct us. Are you willing to listen to God for his truth's sake? Or do you turn to him only when you're afflicted? See, the fact is, fear, which is terror, is only for a period of time. When we are okay, that fear leaves us, then what happens? We also abandon the lessons of God. 
So it is more the fear of the Lord, the respect of God that should keep us going continually. Okay, because it is an attitude, it is a lifestyle response. So for this whole incident, we see that the Philistines were having an encounter with God. And this is not any ordinary God. It's the God of all creation. Just that they did not know Him, they did not understand Him, and they would now begin to discover. Okay, so people have encounters with God, the true God, but they don't understand Him, they don't know Him. And so they have to go and find out. People, including us, the people of God, need to have not just an encounter with God, but also proper knowledge. Okay? Not just encounter, but also proper knowledge. Because you see, now we can talk about supernatural powers, ghosts, and other gods. People can have an encounter with them. You know, some of the some of the, um, pardon me for mentioning some gods, but uh, not against them, but I'm saying that people have encountered, you know, the, the tangi, uh, the, the movement of the, the sedan chair that some, some worshippers carry, okay? Where there's the supernatural shaking of the sedan chair and other gods uh, where a medium finds himself or are suddenly able to flip onto a cupboard, cupboard top, okay? Somersault and flip onto a cupboard top. These are supernatural encounters of gods, demons, whatever you want to call them, okay? So, having an encounter is not enough because we may be following the wrong god or spiritual power or whatever it may be. So, you see, encounter is not enough. Even if we have encounter with God himself, it's not enough. It has to go further, right? It has to go further. And the next thing is knowledge, proper knowledge of God, so that we know, okay, know how we should act and relate to or with Him. Know the true God. But while an encounter with God is good, it's also, it must be accompanied by correct knowledge of His character. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. The character of the true God and how he is to be respected and worshipped. So, all this must be tempered with a proper mind and heart attitudes. Mind and heart attitudes. Because he is an awesome God. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29. Can somebody read for us? I don't have it quoted here. Hebrews 12, 28 to 29. Hebrews 12, verse 28. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshipping Him with holy fear and awe. Verse 29, For our God is a devouring fire. Devouring fire or consuming fire. Okay, thank you for that reading. Okay, so we know that we are going to a heavenly kingdom, so we must have the right attitudes down there. All right, be thankful, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So these are the attitudes. We must have the right attitudes. We must know his character because he is a consuming fire. He's an awesome God. Okay? So every deity, whether Adonai and all other gods and idols, they have their character. Right? Worshippers must worship their deity in spirit and in truth according to their deity's character. What do I mean by character? Let's take a very simple example. Some of you old enough to be Elvis Presley fan, right? Okay, so, uh, if, so some people say, oh, Elvis Presley is my, is my idol. So how do they show that that is their idol? Hairstyle, like Elvis Presley, 
clothing like Elvis Presley, play the guitar like Elvis Presley, sing like Elvis Presley, home makeup all like Elvis Presley, all the Elvis Presley uh, movies and songs and collections and all that. That show, you see, the character of Elvis Presley, their idol, becomes something that they imitate. So, worshippers must worship the deity, that means Adonai, God, Jesus Christ. Okay, we must worship in spirit and in truth according to our God's character. So you see, for the, for the Philistines, they think that this God brings them death. They are so frightened. Okay, they brought the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. Okay, so they have this encounter with God. Do they have the proper knowledge and the proper understanding of his character and how he is to be worshipped? Okay, up to this point, we don't know. Perhaps there are some people who, who will. Let's talk a little bit about that. So verse 12, those who did not die were afflicted with tumours and the outcry of the city went up to heaven. It's very interesting that the Bible actually ends chapter 5 with the outcry of the city went up to heaven. See, God has the power over life and death, those who did not die. Even with the suffering the Philistines were going through, God was watching and listening to them. The outcry went up to heaven. Okay? So we see people who encounter God, they have the opportunity to seek God, to find God, and to know Him, and to give Him the proper reverence and worship. In their own time, whether we talk about the Egyptians, and we have two major Egyptian stories, one all the way back to Genesis, where Joseph, you know, the colorful, colorful robe, yeah, he went into Egypt and he told them about seven years of famine and seven years of plenty. Right? So from that time, the Egyptians had understanding of how this God of Israel, that time was Joseph, how this God of Israel was sending years of plenty and years of famine and how everything worked out through Joseph. So they have knowledge of God through Joseph and understanding to be able to actually convert and receive the true God. Then we have the story of the Egyptians from the Moses story, where Moses engaged with Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt with the plagues, right? And, and Moses brought the people of God out of Egypt after God's miracles. So in their own timing, Right, the Egyptians, two different times, they had opportunity to know God. And then you have the Canaanites, you know, when Joshua brought Israel into the land of Canaan. Remember the Rahab story, right? This lady who became one of God's people and married one of the men, and she had the son Boaz who married Ruth. Okay, so in their own timing, each of these populations, even ancient civilizations, they had their opportunity and now it was the Philistines' turn. They all had their encounter and chance to seek the true and living creator God. See, every civilization that the Bible talks about, they have a chance to know God. You talk about the Babylonian Empire in future, you know, the Assyrian Empire. There were sparks, there were stories that tell us they actually had opportunities to know God, to seek the true and living creator God. So for us in our time and generation, we too have our chance to know God. Question is whether we honour him with our knowledge, our understanding and worship. God has already proven himself throughout human history, all the years. You see, just because the Bible does not mention every single civilization's story does not mean that God did not reveal himself to them. God did not give them opportunity. God has his own way. All right? So we don't have to worry about, oh, what about those ancient people here, those ancient people there? Don't worry. 
Okay, the Bible has actually shown that there were opportunities for a lot of civilizations to actually have chance to know God. It's just that we don't know every single thing. The Bible does not write down every single civilization, but the Bible does say the book of life for all who know God or seek God. Okay, so though the Philistines were enemies of God's people, the Israelites, God heard their cry and will do something about it. See, the cry of the city went up to heaven. God heard the cry of these enemies of Israel. And God will do something about it. In the same way God hears and God still cares for those who are our enemies. For us, do we similarly make the effort to be good to our enemies, inverted commas, that means they're not really enemies. Or maybe some of us have not really learned to be obedient and we really make enemies of our people. Have we been good to them? Or we continue to antagonize people. So we can see from up to this point, God revealed himself to the Philistines. One, he's more powerful than the Dagon and other idols. He inflicted them in each of the territories that they transported his up to. So that's the second thing. He's more powerful than the people, than the gods, and there's no way they could prevail against him. And each territory could not deal with him and they passed the buck to the next territory to host him. Okay, so you see the knowledge of God spreads throughout their territories. It's just they haven't discovered the true information that they really need. But God will give it in chapter 6. Okay, God will give it in chapter 6. So can somebody read for us chapter 6? Let's go um, with 9 verses first, okay? Can somebody read the first 9 verses for us in chapter 6? Okay, I read uh, chapter 6 verse 1 to 9. When the ark of the Lord had been in Philistine territory seven months, the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners and said, what shall we do with the ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. They answered, If you return the ark of the God to Israel, do not send it back to him without a gift. By all means, send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed, and you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. The Philistines asked, What guilt offering should we send to him? They replied, five gold tumors and five gold rats, according to the number of the Philistine rulers, because the, sa the same plaque has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumors and of the rats that are destroying the country and give glory to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did when Israel got dealt harshly with them? Did they not send the Israelites out so they could go on their way? Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pen them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart. And in the chest beside it, put the gold objects you are sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory to work Bethshemas, then the Lord has brought this great disaster to us on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us, but that it happened to us by chance. Thank you. Okay. So total, the ark stayed in Philistine territory for seven months. Uh, our COVID-19, we haven't reached seven months yet. <laughs> okay. So the Philistines, they, they called for the priests and their diviners. So they asked their religious leaders now. Okay. Earlier on, they asked their, lead, their rulers. Now they asked the religious uh, leaders, priests and diviners. What shall we do with this ark of the Lord? Tell us how we should send it back to its place. 
Then the leaders answered, the religious leaders answered, if you return the ark of the God of Israel, don't send away empty. Okay? But send a guilt offering to him. Then you will be healed. And you will know why his hand has not been lifted from you. Okay? So the Philistines, they asked, what guilt offering should we send? And they said, oh, five gold tumors, five gold rats. So you, now we know that there was a plague with rats and tumors. Okay? According to the number of the Philistine rulers. So they have five uh, Philistine city-states. So send five gold tumors, five gold rats. Because the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. Make models of the tumors, the rats that are destroying the city, the country. Pay honor to Israel's God. Perhaps he will lift his hand from you and your gods and your land. Why harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh did when he treated them harshly? So you see, must wait until God is very fierce, very harsh. Then they responded to God. Did they not send the Israelites out so that they could go on their way? What lesson can we learn? Well, the Philistines, they encountered God and now they learn how he is to be approached. Because they didn't know God, ordinary people, right? So they asked their religious leaders for advice and knowledge to understand. And so comes the concept of guilt. Sin or guilt require, against God requires atonement, a guilt offering. You see, when we sin against God, we are guilty. And we need to offer God a guilt offering. Now, the feeling of guilt works like a double-edged sword. Okay, guilt. Some people will teach you, uh, you must not give in to guilt. You know, guilt is bad for you. So, don't let guilt come into your life. Not true. Like I said, it's a double-edged sword. That means it cuts two ways. Okay, it cuts two ways. There's a guilt that cuts the way of condemning. Guilt that condemns is not the way God works. And this is the principle behind Jesus' words, do not judge. Remember Matthew 7, do not judge or, and, or you will be judged. Okay, so Jesus is saying, do not condemn. Do not condemn because you are putting people down and you are not offering them a chance to repent. You're not offering them a chance that is the way of God. So guilt that condemns is not God's way and that's the whole idea of don't judge because the idea of judging that Jesus forbids is about condemning people. But on the other hand, guilt, the other, the other side of the sword is guilt that convicts of wrong. Okay? So condemns is bad because it puts people down and that's it, the end, nothing else. But convicts, guilt that convicts of wrong helps us to know there's something we must change. We must put right an action and or a relationship. Okay? So the guilt that convicts us that we have an action or a relationship to go and do the right thing. Whether with God, with another person, or even myself, that is the good thing about guilt that convicts. And this is the principle behind God's law of a guilt offering. You see, so God has given in Leviticus the sacrifices to make for a guilt offering. So that guilt is not a bad thing. You see, so people who say guilt is bad, you should get it out of your life, are not exactly saying the, the, the right thing because there's guilt that get out of your life only if it convicts you and sets you on the road to do the right thing. Okay? And that's where God has a guilt offering to make relationships and actions right. Then healing was possible. So even these people, they understand, somehow they understand the right thing. And the guilt offering must take into account the people involved. You see, in the Bible verse, it says, the same plague has struck both you and your rulers. You offer this guilt offering of five tumors and gold rats because the same plague has struck you and your rulers. 
So the guilt offering must take into account the people involved. Here, both the Philistines and their rulers were guilty. Okay, They were guilty of not showing the respect to God. Thinking that God is no different from their Dagon. In fact, God is lower than their Dagon. And the act of getting right with God must show honour to Him, show glory to Him, no matter how resistant we may feel inside us. So that's where it says, pay honour or give glory. That's what Jacqueline's version says, give glory to Israel's God. Okay, so the act of getting right with God must show honour or give glory to Him. And there are times when inside us, we feel so resistant about things. Like say, for example, forgiveness. God says forgive. If we are Christians, God's children, then we should imitate our father. Remember, we talked about the character. Earlier on, we talked further up, we talked about the character of the God. Okay, when you, yeah, here, must worship the character, the deity, according to the de deity's character. So God is a forgiving God. Right? For example, one, one illustration, and the act of writing, getting right with God should be, we forgive somebody that we are unhappy with. That will give honour or glory to God, no matter how we feel. I, yeah, I feel so resistant to, I feel so resistant to forgive. Why should I forgive? The person owes me, the person makes me feel like that, etc. Okay, we give all kinds of excuses. So no matter how resistant we may be inside, we argue in our mind and our emotions, we are so upset. We must give glory to God by doing the right thing. So, now, why do you harden your hearts? Okay, so hardening the hearts shows resistance inside us. Now, Adonai is the powerful creator God who deals with man's resistance and disobedience especially when they mistreat God's behavior against his commands. Okay, you see how the Egyptians, they hardened their heart together with Pharaoh. And so the religious leaders here, they know, they know, they're teaching their Philistine people now and the rulers. Why do you harden your hearts? Do the right thing. Give glory to this God of Israel. Okay, and you see, they send the Israelites up in the end, according to what this God of Israel wanted from the Egyptians. So we see that the Philistines, they thought that the way to get rid of the plague, which was caused by the rats, was to make models of the things they wanted to get rid of. They believed that when the models were removed, the real rats would also go with them. The tumors also would go with them. And hopefully, Israel's God would relent and go easy on them, their land, and their gods. So three, you see, consequences hit three levels. Consequences hit three levels. Can I write that down? Consequences hit three levels. One, people, esteems themselves and their leaders. And then their land, then their gods. Okay, we see that they are hoping that by doing what will help them, it will be lift his hand from you, your gods, and your land. So, three levels that consequences hit. So the people, the land, and their gods. So we may not realize it, you see. Maybe now we, we see that, hey, consequences hit three levels. Okay? So there are the human level, and then we may, okay, human level, we may think, okay, we fall sick, so it's obvious, right? But something happens to the land, we may not even recognize and connect it to this particular problem of God, right? And then our worship, our religion, our gods. Okay, God had previously used plagues in verse 6 to force Egypt to release his people. And we saw those 
uh, miracles in Exodus 7 to 12. So the Philistines should similarly release his ark with a guilt offering to get rid of their suffering. Okay, let the ark go and then they will be fine. God will let go of them. And we can see that the power of Israel's God could be seen in his control of events even outside Israel. Yeah? Israel God, Israel's God was more powerful than the Philistine gods. Israel's God was more powerful than the Canaanite gods. Israel's God was more powerful than the Egyptian gods. In later centuries, later Bible stories, when other enemies, especially Assyria and Babylon, proved too strong for Israel and Judah, the people. Okay? These stories that demonstrated God's power, not, that we're reading about Egypt, now Philist Philistines, okay, proved God's power became a source of comfort to God's people and encouraged their faith in his ability to rescue them. So your Christian faith, you must not let go. We learn that the stories and truths of God are the source of sustaining his people through life and through faith towards the eternal kingdom of God. Okay? So truths of God, stories of God sustain us through our daily life and also challenges that we face for our faith towards the eternal kingdom of God. The more deeply and accurately we are able to internalize the messages, the intent, and the truths of God. Okay, so we have from the stories, and some of the truths are taught. Some of the true truths of God are seen through the stories. Okay, some truths of God are seen through stories. There are messages. Okay, there's message that God wants us to pick up. There's the intent. What is God trying to achieve? And what is the truth, the doctrine of God that we need to internalize? We need to get right and get into our system. Then the stronger we can grow in our faith and persevere in our Christian pilgrimage. What stories inspire your faith in and your faithfulness to God to bring you through crisis and tough situations? Okay, so stories are very important to combine with the truths of God because they sustain the Israelites for many, many generations and should be the same for us as Christians. So now they say, the religious leaders continue, now then, get a new cut ready with two cows that have calved and have never been yoked. Pitch the cows to the cut, but take the calves away and pen them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cut, and in a chest, in a box huh, beside it, put the gold objects you're sending back to him as a guilt offering. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. Why? If it goes up to its own territory towards Bichdamesh, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us and that it happened to us by chance. Okay, so the advice of the religious leaders is this solution. But together with this solution, they actually consider the possibility. So you see, they're very rational people as well. Don't just talk about religion. Uh, but part of their religion is superstitious. Like just now we said, the threshold, they don't dare to step on the temple, temple threshold, because Dagon's parts fell on the threshold. So now they're being very logical because they considered the possibility that all these things happening to them maybe were not caused by the God of Israel. Maybe it was. Maybe it wasn't. Yeah. So when something drastic happens, if possible, we would like to find out or confirm if God has done it and why. No, we, like, we always like to ask why. 
Is it God? Why? Why God? Why me? If we could, we would do something to test and confirm the truth to satisfy ourselves. Right? We are very curious people. We may not repent, but we are certainly very curious. Right? Whether we know or we don't know, we are curious. Whether we repent is another matter. But for the Philistine religious leaders, they taught the people to test if it was indeed Adonai behind the disaster on them. Okay, so here they consider possible as not your Israelite, uh, Israel's God that's, that, that's doing all these things. So what they said is the transport on the ark must not be driven or guided. Okay, we give it wheels, we give it an animal, two animals, two cows, to move it, okay? But they left the deity they had offended to direct the cows. And this is a very uh, smart test in the sense of even when they took the cows, the cows have calved, that means they have babies, but they have never been yoked, means they have never been trained to work. Okay, you know as yoke, huh? you put the yoke on the on the neck of the two cows and then the farmer will leap in front and they follow the farmer and dig the, the, the soil. Okay, so these cows have been disciplined and have been trained uh, if they have been yoked. But in this experiment, the cows have babies and they have never been trained to work like that before. Which is to say, if the cows have babies, they are not likely to go anywhere else they will want to stay close to their babies, okay? And they have never been yoked, means they, they won't know what to do. So they did this. And so we see first level is, they took two such cows, all right? So the two such cows we said are the cows that have calved, have babies, and never been yoked. And they hitched them to the cart and penned up their calves. Then they placed the Ark of the Lord on the cut and the chest with the gold rats and the tumors. Then the cows went straight up towards Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way without turning to the right or to the left. Then the leaders of the Philistines followed them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. All right, so we see that God proved himself to the Philistines. He directed the cows that newly calved without hesitation. See, without turning to the right or to the left, they went. So the cows went without hesitation on the road to Beit Shemesh, which was an Israelite city with pasture land given to the Levites. Okay? When Joshua, when Joshua allocated the land inheritance on entering Israel, uh, the Levites were given Beit Shemesh. It was a city with pasture land. So that's where they will have harvest. Okay, so it's a, it's a Levite city. So we see that many times God acted and God continues to act unseen by most of us. You see down here what's happening is the cows put the Ark of the Covenant with all the guilt offering only seen by the five leaders of the Philistines. Which is to say, the rest of the whole world did not see this miracle. Okay? The rest of the whole world did not see this miracle. What's the miracle? Miracle that God acted. And God is acting unseen. God is moving the cows. Yeah? And nobody else sees that there's nobody leading the cows. And these are mother cows that don't want, that will not want to leave their babies behind. But they left the babies behind and they just charged straight all the way without hesitation to an Israelite city. Okay? And some more is a Levite city. What's so important about Levite? Only Levites can carry the Ark of God. So here's a significant thing. God directed the Ark to a Levite city because only Levites were allowed to carry the Ark. God didn't, care, didn't direct the carts to any city because not anybody is allowed 
to carry the ark. Okay, so God acted and God continues to act unseen by most of us. He is the faithful God who does not leave his people on their own, even though they abandoned him. Yeah, Israelites abandoned him, but he still brought the ark back to Israel. But he wants them to learn to be faithful to him and be molded into a faithful people. So God wants Christians to learn to be faithful, even though we are just like the Israelites, we do all kinds of things, we are not always that faithful. Okay, so we see how God has judged, punished Hophni and Phinehas, how God has, through the ark, in that sense, left Israel for a period of time, and God went into Philistine territory to show himself to the Philistines. And then through his miracle, he is coming back to Israel to say, I care for my people. And he is being witnessed, although God is invisible, his act of bringing the, Israel, uh, the ark back, witnessed by the rulers of the Philistines. So some people get to see, but majority of the world do not see. Okay, They will get to know the information that they must share with other people. Just like for us as Christians, we must share the truth of God. Okay, we stop here for today. Any, anything you want to respond to? We have about 10 to 12 minutes or so to round off. And so we will continue next week with uh, verse 13, how God proved himself to Israel. Okay, we have seen God proving himself to the Philistines. Next week, no lesson. Oh, yeah, sorry. Next week, no lesson. Next lesson is on 6th of July, the first Monday of July. Thank you for the reminder. Okay. Alfred, I've been thinking about the subject of, uh, you know, the two leaders, Ophni and Phinehas, huh? Yes. You mean, uh, the, the death of about 34 Israelites during the war. 34,000, yeah. Uh, 34,000. And uh, I, I've, been, I've been thinking about, I mean, I'm of course not trying to change history as what the Bible has said, but if the two of them have been uh, probably a spiritual leader in the sense that they, they don't uh, cause the people to stumble by their behavior, what outcome would probably be different and people probably will, you know, uh, yes. worship God. So uh, I've been thinking about it. I don't know whether in any way it will have an impact in the future in that sense. Positive impact? Yes, certainly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Every, everybody who is faithful to God, they will have that impact in certain way. Uh, it's just that while we are on earth, we may not know. Mm. On earth, we may not know. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. I have this observation now. Quite mm. similar. It's connected to what um, Robert brought up, right? He said even now, uh, Eli is, um, his priestly ministry is like, all wrong. There's a lot of, it's very really negative, and yet it lasted for 40 years, right? Then there's one point you said, oh, when you see like your leaders are sometimes wrong, you should pray for them and you need patience. But 40 years is a very long time. Yes, 40 years is a long time. That's why it's a of testing. Wow, yeah. That is just like, uh, yeah, wow. Yes, wow, indeed. Okay, one point to remember is this, huh? We see the imperfections and the flaws of all the judges, including Eli. We must remember, God uses imperfect people to accomplish his purpose. It is not like what Robert says, where if they had been positive demonstration, then there would have been lasting, lasting positive effects like Moses, like Joshua. There would be lasting effects. Okay? But because they had negative uh, last negative effect, there were negative consequences, but there's one very important thing was we must remember. 
when God used all these imperfect and terrible models to the judges who were very bad, who were very bad examples of spiritual leadership, the most important thing that was accomplished was God's holy people were being preserved from becoming extinct. Okay, so we must remember this. They were imperfect people, very flawed, but God used these flawed people for one very important to make sure that the, the Israelites or the Jews today did not become an extinct people. But you see the ancient civilizations of, we said, the Persians, the Assyrians, and the Babylonians, today they are gone. Right? They were powerful empire, but they are gone today. Greek empire, Egyptian empire, there's no Greek empire, Egyptian empire today. These are not, these are not international powers the way they were in the past. Okay? And some of these civilizations have totally disappeared. But you see how the Israelites as a civilization of holy, God's holy people, they continue to exist in spite of all the bad and wrong things they did. I mean, in God's eyes, huh? okay? So the judges, no matter how flawed they were as spiritual leaders, God was doing something very important through them. Think about it. If God looked for a really suitable, righteous judge, probably they all become extinct before they reach Samuel's generation. You know, they will all become extinct before they reach Samuel's generation. God's holy people will all be gone. So you see, behind all these negative stories is the hand of God at work doing something super important. Huh? Think about it. Actually, I don't quite follow your point. Huh? If you say the judges, they were also good, right? That God's people would have gone. Why? Sorry? God's pe the judges were not good? No. But you said if, if God used perfect people, right? Then perfect. They... God, I said that these were imperfect people. If they had been perfect, they would have other other positive effect that would last. Mm. But their impact was very short-lived. Okay. Their impact on God's people in a positive way was very short-lived. It's only during that 40 years, for example. I also want to check with you uh, about idols, right? You said the people, right, they mix their worship of God. They know there's God, but they still worship like idols like Ashtoresh and Bash. Yes, Bash and Ashtoresh. Yeah, but then you said when they use the Ark, right, actually the Ark is symbol. Uh, to me, like what you said also, is a kind of idol. Is there any difference between this kind of idols when you make something like the Ark uh, representative become idol and actually worsh worshipping another God? Are these so all equally bad or is there any difference? <laughs> It has its shades of implication, okay? But at the bottom line, it's bad because it's still an idol. Okay, so baseline, it is still an idol. But to worship, let's say the ark versus a, a bow, there are the shades, of, the shades of implication that, you see, people can be self-deceiving. Okay. Worshipping the ark, they're not worshipping God. Mm -hmm. People can be misled, whether self-deceiving or misled is wrong. Because while they are on the right God, they are worshipping Him on the wrong track. So Christians can be like that. That's a very obvious example with cults. You know, talk about Jesus Christ, right God. But then they worship Jesus Christ and believe things about Him that are totally unbiblical. And even within us mainstream, mainstream Christianity, it doesn't mean that all of us worship God correctly. There are wrong things that circulate among us. You see? And they can be so subtle, like worshipping the symbol rather than worshipping God. The subtleness is there that 
many or some Christians may not catch that they are actually on the wrong track. Alfred, Alfred. Yes. Uh, can you go back to your part where you talk about the prayer where you highlighted in red, the early, early part? Oh, uh, the prayer part. Uh. Uh, this was actually here, here. line yeah. I went into a sideline, yeah. Okay, here is the prayer of one person, right? You're, one person you're suggesting a, or a yeah. group of people. Can be so my, my question like is said, uh, with or without anyone. The prayer of one and the prayer of two and many, are they the same power? You know, you pray alone or you pray with two or more. The Bible mm -hmm. says you pray with two or more, I'll be there. So praying alone and praying with two or more, any difference? Well, Jesus says when two or three or more are gathered, then he's there in their midst. In terms of accomplishing God's purpose, okay, they will accomplish God's purpose. Give you an example. Remember Abraham? Mm. Paid one person for his nephew Lot. Remember, Lot was in yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. So Abraham, one person prayed. He didn't go to Sod he didn't go to Sodom and Gomorrah, but he prayed to God for his nephew and in fact for the city there. And his prayer was answered in the sense that God saved Lot. Okay, so you have one person praying. Then you have uh, in Acts, where the church was praying for Peter, who was in, in jail. You know, Herod wanted to, put, to execute him. All right? yeah. And the church was gathered together to pray for Peter. And God saved Peter. So one person or many people praying, it accomplishes God's purpose. Okay, so there's no difference between one or two or more. Lah. If, you, if you feel the need or the urge or the prompting to get somebody to pray with you, do it. If you feel that it's, some, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that God wants you to, to do yourself, perhaps then you go ahead and do it. Pray for it. Mm, okay. Am I right to say that when you have uh, two or three, especially when it's here, Two, uh. I think in that instance, probably you're thinking of two person rather than you, that in that case, you exclude God out of the equation. So when Jesus said two or three, I, no, in the terms of two, I think that include him and you. Am I right to say that? I don't get you. No, this. when you say when there are two or three, I will be in the midst. Yes, Jesus. Yes. So I take it that as long even you are one person, Jesus will be there, it's already two. Ah, okay. My, so I, I think most people will be thinking, oh, yeah, must have two other guys before God will be there. You see, in that no, sense, no. Uh, God hears our prayer, yeah. 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 Uh, Daniel also prayed alone and God responded to his prayer, just that his uh, angel arrived a bit late, but God responded to one person, Daniel, praying. In James, it tells us, right? Alfred, in James, it yes. tells us. James 5, 16, I think. Mm -hmm. The prayer of a righteous man avails much. Mm -hmm. righteous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Correct. Prayer of a righteous man avails much. So one person can pray. Yeah. But my takeaway from this whole study of judges and uh, Samuel, mm -hmm. the priest, and all, is that God wants the people to hear him and to obey him. When they disobey him, he leaves them. And they encounter a lot of problems, difficulties, like they lose the war and all that. And when they cry out to him, he answers them. It is like, till today, God is with Israel. He wants them to be totally dependent on him alone, his strength. For example, in the case of Gideon, you saw how he reduced the number of men. 
think that's my takeaway that God wants us to hear Him and to be obedient to Him, and He will answer our prayers. Yes, correct. And the very important thing when we disobey is God wants to, us to. Uh, Oh, I, I will teach that in the next lesson. And that is about spiritual warfare. Okay. When we disobey God, um, God is very good because he uses that as an opportunity to teach us spiritual warfare. Okay, we'll talk about that in the next lesson, which, is, which will be interesting to, to know. Yeah. Right, right. So God is very, very dynamic, can I say, it, in the sense that when we do right, he works. When we do wrong, he works a different way, but he will still work for our good. It's just that we may not actually realize it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Right, so we finish for today. And uh, like I said, our next session will be uh, on the first Monday of July. Okay, we take a break till then. Uh, if you have any questions related to today's lesson, you can still WhatsApp me or those who have my WhatsApp. Yeah. And if, yeah, we just crossed the time. Anybody wants to have a final comment or observation sharing? Yeah, I've got um, something to share. Last week, you talked about the fine line between spiritual arrogance and rebuking people. Actually, after the lesson, I'm thinking, right? God uh, can fight for himself. Uh. Actually, for us, uh, we shouldn't be too eager to go around with rebuking people, even when we see wrong. Maybe the first line should be just pray a lot. <laughs> I mean, God can also write it. Well, wow, that's for me, uh, personally. Mm -hmm. I just kind of realize, yeah. Okay, this is a subject of much that deserves much study by itself. Yeah. This is complicated, yeah. This one. Yes, it's very complicated, yeah. yeah. But yes, but we must remember that sometimes rebuke is like what the prophet did with Eli. It's the first line of letting Eli know. And yeah. later on, God let Eli know through Samuel. So in that sense, there's a confirmation. Okay? And often God, we, we always pray about confirmation over things, right? Then why is it that we, 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 we can accept that? Um, where rebuke or correction of wrong, it must happen because then God can confirm to another source. So if you see, there are two people who hear some message from God about, about a correction or a rebuke or something wrong that must be addressed. If both people keep quiet because they say, oh yo, uh, it's between them and God or I better not be judgmental. See what happens is the two voices are silenced. Correct? that could act like the prophet to Eli as well as Samuel to Eli. The confirmation that you are wrong and you really do need to change. So when that doesn't happen anymore, then this is where God becomes silent because people are just not listening. That's why it came to the point it said in Samuel there, the word of the Lord to Israel was very rare in those days. Why was God's word rare in those days? Because people were happily doing their own thing. Even if you rebuke people, you, who's listening? So God says, you don't want to listen? Fine, I keep quiet. Just like you don't obey me? Fine, I withdraw my protection, let you get oppressed by your enemies, then come looking for me. And then I show you, you need to repent. So, why wait till you suffer like that? Correct? Okay, so this, you see, it, it can be a very uh, diverse subject to talk about with a lot of different mm -hmm. things. But the basic thing we have to realize is this is keeps the, the people of God holy. Remember, it's about holiness. To keep quiet when wrong is happening is to allow holiness of God to be contaminated, like what the Israelites were doing. Can we afford that kind of contamination of holiness? Is the extinction of a people of God. 
Okay, that leads me to the next point. And then you don't go around telling everyone. So if uh, God no, sends no. a message to two persons, that means uh, the community of God uh, is so, so important. When you Correct. have a community, uh, all this will just go flat. That's why I've been talking about community in Ruth yeah. and earlier on chapters in, in, uh, in uh, this uh, about yes. the community with Eli that came to talk to him. Community is very important. If 10 people tell Eli the same thing, then there must be a lot of substance behind 10 people saying. Correct? You see? So the confirmation is more than double. Everybody knows and everybody speaks up so that the holiness can be addressed. So if you need to keep quiet and say it's not my business, it's between him and God, do you actually recognize we are sinning against God? Allowing holiness to be diminished. Of course, the, that's a very important thing that Georgina said. We don't go around happily just happily just rebuking people. I think there are the, that is one danger. We have happy-go-lucky people doing all this rebuking going around who are wrong. Because it's about themselves. It's not really about God and, and the holiness. That could be a problem. Okay, thank you for a lot of this. But this is food for thought to think about. Okay. So I think you all need to go to bed as well, right? Some of you need to sleep early and our... Our friends in America are just getting ready for the day. <laughs> yeah. So we'll be back on the first Monday in July. Meanwhile, you have a good break and keep in touch. Okay. Thank you. Pray. Shall we pray? pray? Father Lord, we thank you, God, for your love and Lord for this uh, time we can study, discuss, and learn together. And we pray, Father God, that you guide us, you lead us to your ways. Lead us to your understanding so that we can have your perspective of things and we can indeed do what is right to honour you. We pray that you will lead us into deeper truth and deeper community as it is meant to be according to you. We pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Amen.